Hello. Hello, hello. Hello. Yep, there we go. Hey, welcome to today's fly tying stream. Hello, sorry. Um, today, we are going to be tying the Gordon. And obviously, title says weekend, weekend, but obviously it's Wednesday. Uh, and that's just because Wednesdays are my weekend, so, you know, heck it. Um, I'm calling this the weekend fly tying stream because, you know, my stream, do what I want. But uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, like I said, we're going to be tying the Gordon. Uh, we're going to be tying it out of, let me just check, uh, Kelson. And, um, yeah, uh, we're just going to hang out. We're going to do this in two parts like normal. We're going to do the body first, and then we're going to do the wing. Um, and, uh, yeah. Let's get started. All right. So, as you can see, whoop. we are starting from a bear hook. So, we're going to do underbody. And this is going to take a little bit longer again today because uh, we are starting from a bear hook. So, um, all the tools. Got a little bit of silk gut here. Running low on this stuff again. So I um, hope everybody is doing well, staying safe. Um, staying healthy, making healthy choices. Trying to thread a bobbin without bobbin threader. Usually fairly simple. I must have frayed the thread a little bit. But that's right. Um, I remember the first time I saw somebody thread their bobbin without a bobbin threader, I had my mind slightly blown. Basically what you're doing is you're just pushing the thread up into the bobbin a little bit and trying to suck the thread through. Um, but I think, and I don't actually own a bobbin threader anymore, so this doesn't work. Go dig for one. So anyway, I'm still, <laughs> I'm fighting this to, to take up some time here because I'm still waiting for the, uh, the, the silk gut to, uh, to soften. So um, I had a little bit of trouble getting the uh, thumbnail right. So that's why A, I'm a little bit late and B, I'm a little bit unprepared. Um, for some reason it wasn't uploading the thumbnail that I wanted. And that was annoying to me. It also cost me like, you know, seven minutes or so. Um, but anyway, new jobs going well. Uh, other than the fact that, I, you know, that I'm working weekends. Um, but, you know, it's still nice that I get two days off per week, Wednesdays and Thursdays. Uh, The Gordon, uh, speaking about the pattern that we're tying today, I've never tied the Gordon before, um, but I find whenever I've seen it tied by others, uh, it's a it's a very attractive pattern. I like uh, I like the way it looks. Um, I think it's got a good balance of, of color and you know just general uh, appearance. 
let me just, I'm going to try and center this a little bit more. Sorry, that was kind of a weird PM. Um, and it's because basically what my setup is, is I have my webcam, or well, you guys, mounted on a camera arm attached to my vice, to the stem of my vice. Um, it's a little bit weird, uh, but I think it works well because, you know, if I accidentally bump the desk, um, the camera and the vice move together. So the fly never blurs, or I should say, the fly doesn't never blur, but it, it blurs less. Um, it appears, you know, to move less relative to each other. But it also means when I make adjustments to the camera relative to the fly, you get some really kind of weird pan effects. Um, all right. So, uh, as always, whenever putting on or tying on a uh, uh, gut eye, you want to lay down a layer of wax thread. You want to make sure that the thread you're using to tie the eye on is well waxed. Because that little extra tackiness does go a long way towards securing the gut. Now I'm going to take the gut, little, little piece of gut. Now again, if I were tying a fishing a fly that I would fish, so a fly that would need to stand up to a little bit more, um, you know, uh, assault, a little bit more activity, um, I would tie the gut all the way down the shank. But because I'm tying this for the wall, you know, I can get away with tying a much smaller piece of gut. Now I'm just going to chew up the ends here. And what that does is it softens up the ends a little bit so that when I go to, um, you know, tie it in, um, the thread will compress those just a little bit more, give me a little bit of a smoother transition. I'm also going to cut the ends, um, can't see that side very well, but taper the ends a little bit. I'm just going to fold the gut over and, you know, just kind of estimate how much gut to leave hanging out. And I'm just going to wrap in a little wraps, making sure um, the gut stays underneath the hook shank. Uh, there are different ways to tie in the gut on a salmon fly. My preference is underneath the hook shank. Um, one, when you are tying in the wing and the throat and other things, uh, you need something to balance the the, um, you know, if you're going for that kind of like perfectly symmetrical, um, head, it's, it, you know, like lacquered head on a, on a fly, um, like that chocolate chip shape where it's, you know, just perfectly symmetrical top to bottom. Um, you'll need a little extra bulk on the bottom because of the bulk of the, of the wing. Uh, and the other thing is I think it's easier to control the bulk. Um, I should say, one of the reasons why people tie their gut uh, on the side, so instead of underneath the, the hook shank, they'll tie it so that the, the, the gut's on either side of the sh uh, shank. Um, from what I know, from what I've heard, um, is that's primarily done for, you know, uh, whole feather wing flies. And that just gives you a broader, broader base side to side for those um, feather stems. One, I don't tend to tie a whole lot of whole feather wing flies, but two, um, I think that that going back to the whole getting a even distribution of bulk, what you're actually doing is you're building up bulk on top, but you're not building up as much on the bottom, and that can really kind of lead to some heads that look wrong. Like it contributes to the top heaviness 
um, that you see in a lot of salmon flies. And it's, it's subtle, super subtle, but uh, it is definitely, definitely there. I don't know what it is, my lip finisher. That's okay. Come on. Um, yeah, whip finishing using your fingers is a little bit more difficult when it's on a, you know, five out hook because you got a lot more shank to work around, especially if you're trying to whip finish a little further up the shank. But it, it works. Can be done. You know, I I've talked about this before, just like how many tools I use or in my case don't use um you know there's some I, I do a lot of tying in hand especially when i'm at shows and they're like the things the things that you need the most are scissor, scissors um and i actually use um you know pliers a lot as well mostly to do things like flatten shanks um if i see a crimp in some tinsel i'll flatten that out But, you know, of all the things that I use the most, it's scissors and pliers. Um, obviously, when I'm tying on a vise, I'll use a bobbin. Uh, bobbin. Uh, I guess a bodkin's pretty useful, too. All right, scratch that. Scissors, bodkin, pliers. Um, and technically, you don't need pliers because you can always mash things with, you know, fingernails or teeth. <laughs> Uh, but things like, you know, whip finishers or even, ha you know, hackle pliers, you know, hackle pliers are probably more useful than whip finishers. You can whip finish using your fingers, um, pretty easily. I try to keep the number of tools I use to a minimum. Um, it's mostly out of convenience, uh, and speed, uh, tying with a lot of tools I find tends to slow me down. Uh, pretty badly. Um, I think if there's one kind of complex tool that I like to use more than others, so, you know, I don't need a whip finisher. I often use a whip finisher, though. But the thing that I, I probably use the most, that is probably the most complicated, you know, in terms of could I make this myself, um, it's probably the articulated hackle pliers, um, because just, those are just so useful for wrapping things like hurls. I don't even use them for hackles. I mostly use them for hurls on these flies, um, as you will soon see, in fact. So the main thing about uh, wrapping on our bodies, and I've talked about this before, but I don't think you've ever seen it in you know, HD. Uh, the main thing is, is to put down flat layers of floss. Um, I'm using a uh, the um, Vivas, uh, what is this, Vivas uh, gel spun. And um, the main thing is, is that they're flat because um, if you get any kind of like, you know, uh, um, like dips or deeper, deeper like uh, troughs or like bumps in them, it'll show through everything. However, um, because the Gordon has a floss body, it's a little less important that the underbody is like perfectly smooth than if I were doing a tinsel body. Um, because wrapping floss over an underbody actually can do a lot to correct like minor variations in the surface. Um, it's mostly when you get like big dips or bigger, you know, gaps in the underbody. Um, again, I'm just, the key to it is laying on your floss or your thread very flat. So I'm, as you can see, I'm constantly spinning my bobbin to flatten out the thread and also to make sure that every single wrap is side by side with the next, with the previous one. 
Um, so I'm not, you know, spiraling or candy cane, candy cane in my way up the body. It's just, it's all very neat and consistent wraps. Um, and you can see that, you know, I saw the, the bobbin back and forth. Now I wouldn't be able to do this if this were like a, a silk thread. Um, this Vivas gel spun is very, um, very resistant to abrasion. Uh, it, for that reason, it's, or part of the qualities that make it resistant to abrasion also make it so it's not my favorite um, thread to use. Uh, I, um, for underbodies, uh, just because it becomes so slippery. Um, but, you know, it, it bulks out well, it goes on very smoothly. Um, and I've got a couple of, um, a couple of spools of this, so I'm just trying to work my way through them. But, uh, you know, saw, the sawing motion, going back to that, the sawing motion here just kind of helps spread out the thread a little bit flatter, a little bit more evenly. And it also helps the th help the thread um, fill any uh, irregularities in the surface of the underbody. So... Now this um this is a Ron Lucas Noble DS hook, I believe. It's either a Noble DS or Noble S. Um, can't remember. Uh, I threw away the package for this hook a, a number of years ago because um this hook's actually a recycled hook from a fly that I didn't like as much as um I thought I would once it was finished. Um, so uh, I don't remember ex the exact model. I think it's a Noble S. Noble DS, one of those two. Um, but this the shank's pretty springy, so you'll see me holding on to this the the, the body as I go. Um, with uh, something like gel spun, that's not a problem. Again, it's very resistant to abrasion. Um, even most silk will is pretty resistant. Um, And there's always going to be a little bit of a bump when you whip something off, but that's all right. Like I said, this is going under a, a floss underbody. Uh, it's going to start. Um, now, again, my personal taste and proportions, I like having the butt uh, approximately where the, the tip of the, the point of the hook is. So essentially what I'm doing here is I'm using the bodkin, or bobbin, rather, as a plumb bob, and I'm just finding where on the body the hook point is, and then I'm going to start my thread there, because again, um, I don't want any bumps, so one one way to avoid bumps is to start your thread a little bit further forward. That just helps blend in, um, you know, any of the... Um, but I use the, the, the bobbin as a plumb bob to find where the where that point starts. It's a very useful trick. All right. And because this point is actually fairly long, um, I'm actually going to start the tag a little bit short of the uh, point of the barb. Uh, I think kind of normal or conventional wisdom is that the the tag should start with the point of the bar, but again, this is a fairly long point on this style of hook. I'm just going to use silver oval. And 
and then I'm going to wind forward just to get the thread out of the way and to bind down that tag end so it's out of the way. Just check my recipe again. Okay. I'm going to give it approximately four wraps. So the first wrap is going to be on bear shank. And then the second wrap is on the very start of that taper. And that gives a very nicely tapered tip. So even the tip has a ta taper. Then I'm going to tie this off on the back side. Everything gets tied off on the back side of the hook, especially down here because everything's a little bit thin. Now, there's not a whole lot of bulk here. So, cut off the excess. I'm just going to wind forward to the front of the tag or where the tag would be. Again, I'm using side by side wraps, thread control. Um, the, the two biggest skills when it comes to wrapping thread, um, no matter what kind of fly you're tying, not just Atlantic salmon flies, but, you know, Catskill dries, um, Carrie Stevens streamers, uh, you know, spay flies, anything, anything with a smooth body um, or that requires a smooth body to look good, the, the two biggest thread skills are flat thread and side-by-side -side wraps. And um, I have heard, I don't tie fishing flies that much anymore, but I have definitely heard from others that do tie a lot of fishing flies that um, even for fishing flies now, the kind of gold standard thread skill is using flat thread. I got a little bit of fuzzy here. I think I got it. All right. Uh, tag um, is... Lemon silk. This silk is very kind of. I cut off way more than I needed, but that's just because this particular piece of silk had a decent amount of fraying in it. So, and for those of you who are wondering, um, I've actually got my uh, uh, trash can between my between my knees. So, you know, if I'm looking down, it's because that's where my trash can is. No dirty thoughts. Um, and tying on a silk, you know, a tip or tag, it's just like wrapping thread, just a little bit, you know, thicker and a little bit more careful because I don't want to fray it. Um, you want to be very careful not to catch it on the, the hook point. Uh, I say it as I do it. Again, silk has to go on nice and flat. Um, I'm using Japanese silk here, although I've, I've said this in the past that my preference usually is for the French silks, which are a little bit coarser, uh, like a Lagarten. Um, and I just like that because they give a little bit more texture. You know, I'm, I won't say I, I am bored. Like that's that's probably a bit of a strong statement, but I'm a little bit, a little bit over. Um, got some fuzzies. Like I said, this this lemon silk is just a little bit beat up, a little bit, a little bit frayed. But I'm a little bit, you know, over. A little bit, you know, 
underwhelmed by perfectly glossy smooth plus silk work these days. One, everybody does it. Um, so it's a little bit trite. And two, yeah, it, it is just a little bit boring, right? So like a, a perfectly glossy, smooth, flat silk body is, I, I feel like it lacks, like it's it's got some depth to it because of that glossiness. But if you just add a little bit more texture to it, it has even more depth. Um, and I know it's a little bit hard to see with the lights on uh, in this frame, but you know when you hold a when you hold a salmon fly in your hand, and the body just has a little bit of extra ripple to it, that that to me is a lot more interesting than just a smooth flat, um, uh, you know, section of floss on a body. Um, okay, I need a tail. I need a topping for a tail. Got lots to choose from now. But I'm looking for one that is the right size. If you're just joining in and you are wondering why I seem to be a little bit less than prepared, it's because I am. Um, I guess telling, saying uh, I was having a little bit of trouble figuring, uh, getting my thumbnail to, to load up properly. So came in a little bit rushed. Um, that looks like a pretty good tail, if you ask me. Uh, now all I'm going to do for the tail is I'm going to take these extra bits of fluff here and, uh, I'm going to trim them down to stubble. And it's not going to be a perfect trim, but okay. So I just trimmed it down to stubble. You can kind of see it there. And I'm just going to tie this in. And now what that stubble is doing is it's essentially helping to lock the tail in place. So it's not just the bare stem that is holding it in place. Actually, that's a pretty good look. Although I think what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna flatten flatten the tie-in point just a little bit because the, the tail starts to curve up from the tie-in point right away. And I want it to lie a little bit more flat and then curve up. So I think what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna take, and reaching for my pliers as always, I'm going to flatten the tie-in point just a little bit, just so it doesn't curve quite as much. And all I'm doing is just gently flattening that area, just so that there's not quite as much curve. And you can just barely see there how there's a little less curve right in that area. All these little tricks, um, you know, if you're just getting started, all these little tricks, then, you know, this is why you go to the the, the fly fishing shows and things. And, and now that we don't have, you know, shows as on a regular basis, like we used to um, due to the pandemic, uh, YouTube videos um, are great for this. And I don't profess to be a very good video maker. Um, there are people that I highly, highly recommend. Um, I think, you know, people like Davy McPhail makes fantastic videos. Um, great instructional videos. Uh, I now that I have this camera, I am planning on filming some, you know, uh, kind of like close-up how-to videos. Um, it's just getting the setup correct so that the, the camera's not in my way. Because like I would put the camera like right here, and so you're seeing it from my point of view. Um, the only problem that I found is that I haven't found a setup in which you know that camera's not like chronically and painfully in the way of my tying because it's not any use to you if I have to, you know, heavily modify my tying style to work around a camera. Um, if that's not how I would do it in real life, you know, so still figuring that out. I know Davey, Davey McPhail shoots his all from that side so that you only see, you know, 
going towards him, uh, you know, the view towards him as if you're sitting across the table. And that's fine. Um, like I said, he shoots very beautiful videos. Um, it's just there, those kinds of videos are, I think, a little less instructive um, than if they were shot from the tire's point of view. Let me just put these crests away so they don't, so they don't lose them. For those of you who wonder, uh, I keep my crests, I store my crests in a, just an Altoids tin. Now the Gordon has a black curl butt. Of course, dyed black ostrich hurl. Um, this was a really good <laughs> batch of ostrich hurl from John McLean at feathersmc.com. Um, but and I, I don't believe I've ever seen anything that is equal. So I'm just going to tie it in, wind the thread forward to get it out of the way. And this is where my articulated uh, uh, hackle pliers come in. It's where I really think they shine. Now what I'm going to do is mm -hmm. nope. You know I occasionally do this, um, but and I I've said this. You know, ostrich hurl. Uh, well, any hurl actually has a direction, an up and a down. I just tied that upside down. Uh, that's because ostrich hurl and peacock hurl are have like a T cross section. I wish. Um, I can draw this out for you. So, jump board. So, if you think like, you know, you have your hurl. Right, and that's a terrible drawing, but you know, it just looks like a stick, right? But what you're actually looking at, if you were to look at it end on, what you have is a stem vertically here, and then the fibers, the fluffy parts, actually come out from the tops there. So these would be the fluffy parts, and this would be the stem. Um, and because of that T kind of cross section, it means that when you tie it in on the hook, sorry, I'm looking at the screen to make sure I'm, I'm holding this in frame. Um, when you tie it on the hook, you're actually tying it, it, it has a direction, it has an up and down. Um, and that, that's really important because you want the stem, you want the fluffy parts, if you're winding, say if I'm winding the hurl this way, you want the stem pointed this way and the fluffy bits that way. And that way you get the most dense, uh, um, the most dense uh, butt or, you know, whatever um, hurl you can get out of, you know, this. So when I'm winding it, when I'm tying it in, I'm tying it in such a way that when I start to wind it, the stem is going this way, and the top of the T with the fluffy bits is going that way. Hope that all made sense. <laughs> now, what I do just to help it out a little bit is I do kind of I'm not folding the hurl, but I am pulling the the fibers, the barbs, to the rear of the stem just so they don't get caught underneath the stem going in the wrong direction because that would look messy. And I'm going to wind. And I usually wind, I probably wind more turns of hurl because um, I like a good thick butt. Don't tell my wife. Um, 
I'm just going to tie it off. Uh, really, wrapping hurls is the only place where I use hackle pliers. Um, the only the other time that I might use a hackle plier is if I'm tying in a hackle and I'm tying in hand. Uh, and I just do that because the, the hackle plier adds an extra bit of weight, um, which is really useful. I dab a little bit of wax onto the thread there. Just bind down the, the end of the, the hurl. Okay. I'm going to back the thread off one. Two wraps. Again, um, I don't count my thread wraps. Uh, probably unlike a lot of um, tires. But I don't, I don't count my thread wraps because uh, I've just gotten a feel. Like, I know I'm over-wrapping a lot of parts. And again, it's, it's knowing when good enough is good enough. Um, because I'm using such fine thread, you know, this is 70 denier thread. I don't have to worry so much about thread bulk. Uh, or I don't have to worry as much about thread bulk. Um, and the other thing is, again, I know how many, I, I know that I'm over wrapping something. So I also know that I can unwrap safely, you know, two or three wraps. Um, and I just know that because I know that I'm over wrapping. Um, it's, it's just kind of one of those intuitive things at this point. <clears throat> Tie in the ribs. The ribs are going on the back side of the hook as usual. And uh, again, following the principle of first on, last down. So the first thing that gets tied on is going to be the last thing that gets wrapped. So in this case, the first thing on was the oval silver. And then the second thing on was the <coughs> flat silver. And that's because the flat silver is going to be what's wrapped first. So it was on second. And the oval silver was on first, so it would be the last thing wrapped. Confusing? Makes sense. It works. Um, oop. And I'm just going to tuck this in here. Handy dandy built in material keeper. Now I'm going to wind, wind down the tinsel um, with oop. not very neat wraps. Uh, let's make those a little neater. Side by side, flat, uh, flat thread wraps. Again, I'm trying to keep the bulk more towards the back side, so that the you know in profile the body looks um, less bulky. I'm going to wind. Um, I'm going to wind to approximately one third. So the body of the Gordon is one third yellow silk and one third claret silk <coughs> or sorry two thirds claret silk and um so that's about one third maybe a little less that's about one third so we'll do yellow silk same yellow silk as the tag And then once we tie in the yellow silk, we're also going to tie in the hackle, which is a claret hackle. And this is JEC. Um, I don't have any yellow Lagarden, um, but why would I? Because I have a nice JEC silk. Um, but my preference would be a yellow Lagarden if I had it. I don't, so. Not using one. Um, tied in. Um, as you can see, I use a thread wrap technique or thread thread trap technique when tying in silk, which means I just slide the silk under the last um, thread wrap and that traps it underneath. <clears throat> I'm just gonna wrap down and back yellow silk again flat and side by side wraps. Um, okay. 
Again, I'm using the same technique where I'm just kind of sewing the silk back and forth gently, gently, because this is silk, not, not gel spun. <clears throat> but doing that just kind of helps the silk fill any kind of irregularities that there might be. One more up. And then the thread. Tie it off. And I'm going to trim, but I'm going to trim it long because this is going to form part of the underbody now. And then I'm going to choose my claret hackle and I grab the red claret. One second. That was good, Claret. Now the question is, can I find a hackle that is appropriate? And this, I say this every single time, I need to get some more Claret hackle. But these have been pretty well picked over just because I have had this bag of hackle for a while, so. Uh, apologies if this takes me a while. Um, I'm looking for, so what I'm looking for in a, in a good hackle is good taper, um, a fiber length that isn't too long because, uh, you know, you want a good taper back to front and then you don't want your longest fibers of your body hackle to be longer than the fibers of your throat hackle. So, let me see. C1. Might be a little bit long in fiber, though. It's got a good taper. This will be a very long hackle. Uh, not, maybe not. Maybe not right for this fly. Because this is only a, a 5 aught hook. Um, a lot of the genetic hackles these days will tie much larger. Even the Chinese necks will tie much larger these days. So, so I think this one looks pretty good. Oh, it's two. I'll take this one. So if we tie it in there, we can avoid. So we're only going to get three turns of hackle out of this. Um, and it's just because the fact that we're tie of where we're tying it in. I'm going to tie it in on the back side of the hook. There. And then we're going to wax our thread for a few wraps, at least. That'll just help bind it down. And it won't be, and, and the wax thread won't affect the, the silk going on top of it. Uh, you know, it, it seems like it might, but um, it won't, as long as the, um, you know, the silk is, uh, as long as you're careful. Okay. Just going to trim ankle tip so it's not too long. Flatten our thread as usual. Continue wrapping. Again, always flattening my thread as I go. Just binding everything down securely. Alright, 
So we'll go, we're gonna we're gonna tie the body to about there, and that's um, because the Gordon does have a uh, black wool head, um, at least as called for um, in. Uh, Gosh darn it, Kelson, right? Or Hardy? As called for in Kelson. <laughs> well. right. So that means I do have to leave a little bit of space at the at the head for the uh, black wool dubbing. Um, so if you're just joining us for the stream, um, I'm tying this fly in two parts. So today I'm doing the body. Uh, next week, um, whenever I have stream next week, uh, I will do the wing. Um, we are tying the Gordon uh, out of Kelson. And I appreciate you joining me. All right. Um, The uh, second two thirds of the body are claret silk, and uh, so again, I have claret JEC. Tie that in, wrap forward, and then wind down and back as usual. Uh, you know, um, if you have any questions or, or you know, um, any anything you want clarified, uh, you know, there is a chat box um, that you can type questions into. Uh, just like I say, it shows. I might not look up, so you might it might be a while before I see it. But feel free to sound off and, and chat. You know, I miss, I, I do miss tying at shows because of the, the, you know, person to person interaction. Um, I feel like, you know, live streams are great because it, it's a way to continue tying flies live, but it's not the same because you can't have, you can't ask questions in real time. Um, it's definitely a little bit more difficult. And also, you know, the technology of the camera, you know, every time my, my kind of pale hand passes in front of the, the camera, the camera's white focus changes. Um, but, you know, it's a, it's a fair facsimile for, for what, you know, consider, all, all things considered, uh, which seems to have become the refrain of 2020, all things considered. Also, if you're just joining, um, it's this is labeled as a weekend fly tying stream because Wednesdays and Thursdays are my weekends. Uh, I work Saturday and Sunday, unfortunately, right now. And um, take my Wednesdays and Thursdays off. Now I don't, uh, I, some questions I get is why don't I uh, wear gloves while um, tying in silk? And it's because if your hands are clean and dry, um, you know, and have been, you know, recently washed, uh, you know, your, your hands shouldn't impart any dirt or oil to the silk. Um, You know, you don't need gloves to handle to handle silk if they're if they if they're clean. So, 
I know a lot of people believe you do, um, or, you know, particularly people with like rough skin or rough fingers. Uh, I use a pumice stone, you know, just kind of take off the burrs in my fingers. Uh, I, I don't always do the best job, but um, I have some of these pumice stones and I just use it to take off the, the edges on your fingers. That's really useful. Um, but that, 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 that just makes it so you don't have to use wear gloves. And I like being able to feel the silk as I wrap it. Um, now, I said first on, last down. So the last thing, the last bit of the rib that I tied in, the second bit of the rib that I tied in was the flat silver. So that's the first thing I'm going to wrap. I'm going to get two wraps there. Come on. To fall right there. So I always wrap an odd number of wraps of rib. And for me, that almost always means five. Um, that's just because I think an odd number kind of looks the best. It also gives the best spacing. Uh, it's also an odd number of wraps of rib are the easiest to cheat <laughs> if you have to cheat. So then the oval silver goes on, just following the trailing edge of the flat silver, right snug up against it. And because I tied it in first, but I'm wrapping it second, um, it follows that trailing edge just nicely. I'm just using my thumb a little bit just to hold it in place as I wrap it. And then I'm using my left hand to manipulate the bobbin here because I'm using my right hand to maintain tension on the rib. Um, if there is a more advanced skill that I would learn uh, as a classic salmon fly tire or any kind of classic fly that requires, you know, a, a more complex set of um, you know, bodies or, or materials, um, being able to manipulate a bobbin either handed, um, or while working around a vice is probably the skill that I recommend the most. So I'm just going to get one kind of firm wrap of thread there to keep the, um, The rib firmly place, and then I'm going to wrap the fold the hackle. I'm basically just pulling it away from the body at a right angle, and then gently pulling the fibers to one side of the stem. Not, you know, pinching it. I'm not forcing it, and it doesn't even have to be fully folded. It just needs to be so that they're all pointing in this in towards the rear of the fly. And I'm just going to wrap. And I'm going to follow the rear of that tinsel so that the stem of the hackle follows the oval silver exactly so that there's no gap. Again, I'm just using my thumb and forefinger to hold it in place as I go. And then follow it up right up the side and then again I'm holding the hackle of my right hand manipulating the bobbin with the left tie it into place trim it off and then take my wax wax the thread tie everything down so it's tightly bound 
of a tail fiber, errant tail bit fiber. I will probably end up trimming that because that looks to be just bent. <laughs> um, anyway, wax my thread, bind everything down going forward. Then I'm going to unwrap to kind of that wax thread part because I do need to add a throat. <clears throat> and the throat is blue, uh, bright blue, a uh, brilliant blue. Um, this is probably too blue um, properly for this pattern. Um, but this is the blue I got. Uh, it's probably more of a, the proper color is probably more towards teal than this. Uh, the only other color that I have though is a darker blue, which is definitely not right. So we're going to try and pick one, a feather from this pack that is a little bit more on the teal side. Oof. Feather fuzz everywhere. Um, and because this is being tied in as a throat, um, it doesn't need to be, um, it doesn't have to have any taper, this feather. This feather can be, um, you know, taperless or straight sided or, you know, with minimal taper. Um, and also there's not quite the concern for the length of the fibers as there was for the body hackle. So um, just as long as it's not too long, doesn't look too long for the hook shank, then it's okay here. Again, because, you know, this is the throat. So um, this one's pretty... Let's see. Uh, it's pretty good. So let's use that one. Um, this one's, uh, I think this is a pretty good example of a, um, not very tapered feather, which again, I want to use here because I want to save the tapered ones for the body, for body hackles. blue fuzz everywhere. You know, I don't mind feather fuzz, but man, you're like, um, I've heard it called feather dust. Um, I don't mind having a whole bunch of that, like, because it happens, but like the really fluffy stuff from the bottom of hackles is probably the most annoying. I'll undo this one more just because I, I do want to tie the tip of this hackle in using wax thread. So because I waxed a little bit here to tie off the, the other hackle and the, the ribs and all that, I want to use a little bit of that wax thread to tie down this hackle because this hackle isn't going to have quite as much used to tie, hold it in, right? So if you think the body hackle I ran all the way, the tip of the body hackle, I ran pretty much the entire length of the remaining body. This only has that little bit uh, holding it in. And, you know, there's nothing, there's probably nothing. I can probably think of a few things that are more annoying, but there are very few things that are more annoying than winding a hackle only to pull it out by the tip uh, and just the tip. Um, that is one super annoying, because uh, then you have to go back and this, if it's like the body hackle, um, you know, you have to undo parts of the body to go back and put the hackle back in. Um, the throat, it's not quite such a big deal, but, you know, it's still annoying when it happens. So try to avoid that by using wax thread. I think I'm going to get about three or four turns of throat in here. It's a nice, brilliant blue. I'm going to tie it in. Plenty of length. Stop swinging. All right. 
just going to pull the hackle back and finish binding down the tip. And then bring the thread all the way back to the stem. Now, I'm not one to I'm not one that generally pulls the hackle down below the hook. Um, I, I I don't think that's necessary. Um, I also like the bushier look of a just full 360 hackle. <clears throat> so I'm not going to do that. Uh, I know a lot of people do pull their hackles uh, down under the hook shank, but um, that's just not not my not my taste. So I won't. But anyway, this is the body of the Gordon. Um, and it looks a little bit messy, and that's because a lot of these flies, especially with all the hackles that they had piled on top of them, uh, were meant to be pretty buggy. You know, um, the, the, uh, and in a large degree, like the primary focus of a salmon fly, it might be argued, is the wing. So, you know, the body was just a little bit of extra movement, maybe a little extra color and flash, but really it's the wing um, that is the focus. Cause you know, you get, you know, the gaudy wings and these days, especially with like the built wings, um, you know, bodies are good looking body is nice, uh, but oftentimes it's, it's, quite secondary to the wing, um, especially the way people tie classic Atlantic salmon flies these days. Um, talked about this before, oftentimes they tie the wings too high, um, too thick, too broad. Um, but that is a rant that I have gone on before. Uh, <laughs> don't need to repeat it too much. Uh, but um, anyway, like I said, we'll finish this fly uh, next week. Let me bring you guys up to me. And uh, focus. So, um, like I said, we'll finish this fly next week. Uh, we'll do the wing um, and uh, finish out the fly. <clears throat> um, thanks for hanging out with me. Uh, if you are new here and want to see more of my work, uh, you can check me out on Instagram. It's at justwondering.brad. Uh, if you would like to support the channel or purchase any of the flies that you see me tie here on the channel, plus, you know, some others that I just tie in my free time, uh, you can check out the Etsy shop. It's Studio1213 on Etsy. Uh, all of the money, um, you know, you guys, uh, uh, all the money that I earn through the Etsy shop, that you guys are, you know, great, generous enough to, to, to purchase flies. Um goes back towards purchasing materials to tie flies, um, purchasing new technologies. So for example, I got this microphone, uh, the camera that uh, I'm streaming on today, uh, all because people, you know, very generous people purchase flies through the Etsy shop. Um, I think uh, in terms of streaming time, I think Wednesday, Wednesday afternoons um, are probably when I'm going to be. Uh, um, hey, uh, ASDF. Uh, uh, I guess Guten Abend. Yeah. Um, sorry, my German. Uh, my German isn't very good anymore. Um, but I grew up. My parents lived in Switzerland, <coughs> and so I grew. I actually grew up speaking German in the house. Not very good German. Um, very American German, uh, but they tried to instill in us a foreign language. And because German was the language they knew, um, German was it. <laughs> <coughs> Excuse me. I've been talking too much. But anyway, um, I think Wednesday is going to be the stream time. Um, I'm not 100% on that yet, but it seems to work the best uh, for for me. And I'm... You know, we've actually had a pretty good number of people uh, watching the stream live. So appreciate it. Uh, thanks for hanging out with me. Um, again, feel free to sound off in the chat. 
um, and in the comments below, once this posts on YouTube, uh, say hi and ask questions. Uh, if you have a request for a fly, um, I can't guarantee that I will be able to tie it. Uh, I am limited by the materials that I own, um, which right now, because of the pandemic and just my inability to to get out, <coughs> um, I have been tying a lot more. And that means I've been ripping through my materials. I do have to make another shopping trip um, either to AO Feathers or feathersmc.com. Uh, I just haven't uh, been able to do that recently. So my material stash is a little bit depleted right now. <coughs> Excuse me. All dried out from Gavin at you. So I'm going to call it there before I um, start to sound like a COVID patient. And uh, <laughs> I will see you all next week to finish this fly and um, talk to you then. Stay safe, stay healthy, and uh, see you later.